Well, hello everyone. Today I want to review Shogun by James Clavell, an epic work of historical fiction. I haven't done a lot of single book reviews on this channel, but I felt that a book this thick, about 1300 pages, and frankly, this good deserves its own review. Most of the time, most of my reviews are simply a couple minutes worth during my monthly roundups where I do reviews of everything I read. But this book deserves its own time and its own video. Now, I haven't done a lot of single book reviews. So first of all, if you see me occasionally looking down, I'm consulting my outline. I want to make sure I don't miss anything because I haven't done many of these where I talk about a single book for a long amount of time. So I want to make sure I don't miss anything that I think are pertinent things to tell you about everything that I love about this book. So before I start, this will be a spoiler-free review because, frankly, I hope that someone sees this video and wants to read it. I love this book, so if I can just pass on that desire to read this book to one other, the video has, has been worth it. Um, I also want you to let me know if you like single book reviews on the channel. Again, it's a small channel here. Uh, we're creeping up on 300 subscribers, which is pretty cool. I never thought I'd get 100, to be honest, but uh, I do want people to watch these videos and like these videos. So if you do like this format, let me know. Or if you have any suggestions, let me know in the comments. And of course, with any video, like, comment, subscribe. Those are the three things that help the YouTube algorithm send this video out to others. Okay, so uh, I'm breaking down this video into four parts, and the first part is why I decided to read this behemoth of a book. The second part, I'm going to break down what it's about, the plot, the characters, the setting. The third part, I'm going to talk about the main thematic areas, and then at the very end, I'll just wrap it up with, you know, what I liked about the book, what I didn't like about the book. But there's a lot to like about the book. I tweeted when I finished this book. I finished this book January 16th, and I said that I may have just read my best book of 2022, and I really do believe that it is that good. So let's get started with why I wanted to read this book. I generally like epic tales. I like longer fiction. Not that I don't enjoy concise storytelling, but I like long book series. I like longer books. I like the big thick boys that sit on the shelf. And this is definitely one of those. Um, when I enjoy something, I like to just get more of it. That's one reason I mentioned in a past video that movies are fine, but great television series I prefer more. Same thing with books. Give me more. 300 pages versus 1,300 pages, I want the big boy every time. So one of my favorite books is Pillars of the Earth. And Pillars of the Earth is about a thousand page work of historical fiction that is probably the most universally loved book that I've ever read. And Cle uh, Clavel, no, Clavel wrote Shogun. Ken Follett wrote Ken Pillars of the Earth. He wrote two sequels and a prequel that are each about 900 to 1,000 pages and all four of them are outstanding. Well, after reading those four books and realizing how much I just loved this epic length historical fiction, which you don't find as often as, you know, epic fantasy, for example, I just wanted to find more. So I started to do a little bit of research and I discovered things like uh, The Winds of War by Herman Wauk looks like something I want to read quite a bit. Um, some classics that I've read, some that I haven't that moved up on the TBR. Um, the works of James Mishner is another another author that I want to get into maybe this year. But the one that shot to the top of the list was Shogun by James Clavell. So in addition to it being epic length historical fiction that is so universally praised, the setting really appealed to me. It's set in Japan in the year 1600. And having taken a trip to Japan, uh, 2015 I believe it was, I was really enamored with the Japanese culture and its history. I was there as a citizen ambassador, and the people of Japan were, frankly, the most generous, the most mindful, the, the nicest people I've encountered in any of the traveling that I have done. And I just fell in love with the Japanese culture. So reading a work of historical fiction set in Japan at that time during the feudal times of Japan, the times of the samurai, is something I've never experienced. So I immediately was drawn to this book. And of course, Shogun shot all the way up to the top of my TBR. So what's it about? The year is 1600, and we follow John Blackthorne, who is the pilot of a Dutch sailing ship. 
Blackthorn is English and he's on this Dutch ship and they've sailed through the Magellan Pass and they're in the Pacific. They encounter a storm and end up shipwrecked on the coast of Japan. Only about a dozen of Blackthorn and the other sailors on the ship survive. And initially this book grabbed me because we have Blackthorn in a very alien environment, a very, very different culture, doesn't speak the language, and it reminded me of many scenes of fantasy and science fiction where you get your protagonist in a very alien world. This alien world just happens to be on the other side of our world at this time, 1600. So the initial descriptions of Japan through Blackthorn's eyes, this alien culture, is very, very interesting. Again, very, very much like a science fiction or fantasy tale, even though it is in our world. And one thing that Clavel does to reinforce that fact is that he doesn't translate so much of the Japanese in this book, especially early on. And it just reinforces that, that feeling that Blackthorn has. You really put yourself in his shoes in feeling what it's like to be in this alien culture where everyone's talking around you and you don't know what they're saying until he starts to learn the language. One of the first words he learns is wakarimasen, I do not understand. And you learn a little bit of Japanese along the way. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more probably in the wrap up. So after Blackthorn is kind of a prisoner of the Japanese for a short amount of time, one of the daimyo, whose name is Toronaga, takes an interest in Blackthorn. The daimyo are five regents that are ruling Japan at this time. And they are ruling Japan until the heir is of age to become emperor. But these five regents are always jockeying for power, and there's always, you know, political machinations. And right now, Toronaga, the one who um, kind of discovers Blackthorn in his territory, sees that Blackthorn might be an asset in his own political maneuvering. He thinks perhaps that Blackthorn, with his sailor's background, can teach his constituents how to build the greatest navy in the world and because of that maybe he as a regent will be more powerful than some of his enemies of the other regions. So he takes an interest in Blackthorn. Toronaga is a very fascinating character especially as the book goes on and even at the very end of the book he, he remains a very very fascinating character. So obviously there's going to be a trouble between Toronaga and Blackthorn conversing with each other Blackthorn doesn't speak Japanese. Tornaga only speaks Japanese. Initially, there is a translator that's a Jesuit priest, but as Blackthorn is not Jesuit, we see a lot of the conflict between Catholics and Protestants. In fact, Blackthorn hates this Jesuit priest. But the Jesuits had trained a female samurai named Mariko in languages. Although she remains a samurai, she's also a Christian and she speaks Portuguese and Latin and Japanese. So she becomes, at Toronaga's request, translator and confidant of, of, of Blackthorn, who they rename. They rename him Anjinsan because the letter R and the TH are not present in the Japanese alphabet. So because of that, Blackthorn is hard for them to say. So they name him the Anjinsan, which is the pilot son. So through Mariko and through Blackthorn's own persistence in learning, he becomes a valuable member of Toronaga's people. And I'm not gonna give away any more plot points from there because we'll keep this spoiler free, but let's just say that the plot gets very riveting. There's a lot of things that go on throughout this 1300 page book. In fact, the, a lot of these events happened, not exactly like they unfolded in the novel. They happened over a course of several years. Um, but Clavel used real-life events and real-life people to tell this, this tale that we read in Shogun. I forgot to mention in this video that I did a little bit of research into the historical accuracy to Shogun. And I discovered this book called Learning from Shogun, Eastern History and Western Fantasy, which is edited and is basically a bunch of essays from a lot of historians. And come to find that a lot of what is in this book is very factual. None of the people are historical figures, but they're all based off of historical figures. And even though he kind of plays fast and loose with some of the 
cultural things, for the most part, these historians were actually very complimentary as to how Clavel portrayed Japan in Shogun. So I just wanted to insert that here because I have seen some reviews where people say, oh, that's not what Japan's like. Well, in 1600, that's what Japan was like. So let's talk about themes. The most obvious theme is the fish out of water, stranger in a strange landscape that we get through the eyes of Blackthorn early on in this book. But the biggest theme that we get is one of cross-cultural learning. There are a lot of other prominent themes here that I could talk about as well. We have gender roles, we have uh, respect for authority, we have religion, uh, religion versus secularism. But the overarching theme under this for me and the thing that made it most compelling as a, as a reader was the cross-cultural learning that all of the people in this book experience, not just Blackthorn and Madiko, because they are thrust together by Toronaga, but the other Japanese and even some of the Portuguese Jesuit priests that we that have point of view chapters, just seeing the different cultures learn from each other, I found very, very fascinating. So both sides at the start are pretty xenophobic. Um, you see the through the different point of view characters always calling the other side barbarians. And I found that very interesting. And you see how through Blackthorn and Modico learning from each other, they start to cease thinking of them as barbarians. They still think of some aspects of each other's culture maybe a bit barbaric, and both are probably correct in that assessment. But overall, they don't see the people themselves as barbaric. So that was something that was very interesting to me. And I found just compelling seeing all of the people in this story especially some of the Japanese samurai who hated Blackthorn at the start, learn and grow through the interactions. And I think that's what the best aspect of any cross-cultural learning is all about, is starting to understand each other and communicate with each other and starting to appreciate what another human being, what their background is like. And I found, that, I found that very fascinating, very interesting, especially some of the harsher samurai when they start to appreciate a little bit more of some of Blackthorn's, you know, more European traits. But most of these are through Blackthorn's eyes, and it starts small. So apparently in the 1600s, especially in someone who's not a noble class like Blackthorn, in Europe, um, people didn't really bathe. They bathed once a year. In fact, they thought that um, if you bathed too often, you would be more susceptible to diseases. In fact, they often, in their own homes, rarely opened the windows because they didn't want fresh air to come in because it would bring diseases. So immediately when Blackthorn is, becomes Anjinsan and starts to bathe every day and has an injury which is treated by medicine in Japan, he sees that, okay, maybe the bathing is a lot better here, and he sees immediately how the medical care he receives is far superior to what he would have got in Europe, which would have just been to simply, oh, we'll just bleed him, <laughs> which I think was still prominent for a couple hundred years. So it started very small, but it's something that just opened Blackthorn's eyes to seeing, well, maybe Maybe they're not total barbarians. Maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's something I can learn from this. And again, seeing the other side, seeing the Japanese learn from Blackthorn as well, but especially Blackthorn and Madiko through their conversations because she's the only person that Blackthorn can talk to. So he talks with her quite a bit. So they obviously become close and seeing her learn from him as well and to appreciate certain aspects of his character and his culture, seeing her learn was, was just fascinating for me as well. And of course, as they get close, you start to like this relationship, which I did quite a bit. And then about halfway through the book, another character notices how amiable they've become and how close they've become and simply says, oh, this can't end well. And I immediately read the last half of this book with just a lot of trepidation because I had grown to love this, love this relationship that had developed between two people just simply through conversation and getting to know each other and understand each other. So uh, there was a little bit of trepidation in my part to keep reading, thinking, oh, is he foreshadowing by saying 
through this character, this can't end well? You'll have to find out if you read the book. I loved how both of their characters could appreciate each other's culture without abandoning their own beliefs. And I liked how Clavel never said, oh, he never took the line that the Japanese culture was better, or the European culture was better, because neither is true. There are aspects of both, both cultures that you could easily argue were more superior and more modern, at least to 21st century readers' eyes to what they experienced. But Clavel never said that one was better than the other. And even though Blackthorn, I think, throughout the book started to lean towards liking the Japanese culture a lot more than his own, he still maintained a lot of the remnants of who he was before he landed in Japan. The closest that we came to thinking that he was going to totally embrace the Japanese culture is about halfway through the book. He is reunited with the other sailors and he sees them and they sicken him because he had grown, he had learned from the Japanese. He had, you know, learned a lot about their culture and he just saw his fellow sailors as just these dirty, ignorant human beings that he kind of had a bit of loathing for. Even so, he still wanted to be back on the ship with them. So it towed the line very, very well. And a lot of this I've read has come from Clavel's own background. He was a prisoner of war of the Japanese in uh, World War II. And this isn't a case of Stockholm Syndrome. He wasn't treated ill, but in, I think he was a prisoner of war for like two years. In that time, he started to learn about the Japanese culture and became interested and learned more and more. And that was kind of the genesis of Blackthorne's character and why he wanted to write this book. Although Blackthorne is based off of a real life historical figure, I think his name was William Adams, who is known as the first English samurai. Um, you can look that up and see if I'm right or wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll interject something here. Okay, hopefully I didn't just interrupt myself. <laughs> So two more points in this section. One is a reason that I personally connected with Blackthorne's character early on, and that was his love of learning. As I mentioned, when he saw his fellow sailors who had not learned anything in their time in Japan, whereas he was learning and growing, that love of learning and that thirst for knowledge is something that connected with me personally. I find that as my own personal defining trait as a human being, as I love to learn more about just about anything. And seeing Blackthorn just really wanting to immerse himself in this culture and learning as much as he could, as he could through Mariko and all of their conversations was great. I mean, he got excited at one point where the Jesuits gave him a dictionary of translation. I mean, he was so excited to have a dictionary because he could really, really learn the language more at this point. So I really connected with Blackthorn quite a bit through that love of learning and seeing him just want to be so much more and learn so much more so that he could be more valuable to Toronaga. One last thing in this section before I give you a wrap up. I want to thank James Clavel for providing me a service, a personal service. I've probably mentioned in other reviews that one setting that I never understood at all. I've never understood sailing and pirates and the allure of the open seas. And for the first time, an author explained it to me. Now, maybe other authors have done this in the past and it just finally clicked for me now. But for the first time, I understood that for these sailors, the allure of the open sea is about freedom. And you think about Blackthorn, who's probably a lower to middle class if such things exist. So I guess non-noble class at the time is, is more accurate. This is a way to get away from the mundanity of life. So I thank James Covell for that because I never truly understood the allure of the open sea. And he explained it for me very well in this book. So thank you. So my final thoughts in this book, what I liked and what I did, didn't like. <laughs> There's a whole lot of like and very little didn't like. I love the cross-cultural learning. The conversations between Mariko and Blackthorn were so riveting. I loved seeing both of them learn and grow. And 
that was just fascinating to me. The plotting and pacing were superb. 1,300 pages absolutely flew by. There wasn't a moment where I felt it was slowing down. And for it to remain riveting when it's this big, I mean, that's, that's an impressive work by an author. Clavel's prose, I, I can't say I loved it or disliked it. It did the job. You know, it's not a, you know, he's not a Charlotte Bronte with a pen, but neither is he someone that I was reading and thinking that, you know, he'd to work more on his prose. I think it worked perfectly for this tale. It told the tale well. I loved the immersion. I loved feeling much like Blackthorn that I was immersed in this culture, but I will say that some readers won't like the immersion, especially the aspect where um, Clavel doesn't, always translate everything. In fact, as Blackthorn starts to learn the language, he'll often translate a phrase maybe two or three times, and then if Blackthorn's speaking it, they won't translate it anymore. They expect you as a reader to keep up. And although that makes it maybe a little more difficult, I didn't think it was very difficult, even if I forgot a few, and yes, there were a couple times I had to pull up Google Translate, but most of the time, you know, he gives you good context cues that you can understand, but I love that aspect of it. I felt like even though I was just reading a book for sheer entertainment and I was wholly entertained, I felt like I was learning to. And for me, that's a great combination of a book. So my summation here, I hate to be an agent of recency bias. I hate when I see that when a, when a review comes out. Goodreads or Amazon or, or BookTube or whatever, and someone says, oh, this is the greatest book ever. But I have to say, I'll be shocked if I read anything better this year. And I'll be shocked if when I get six months away from this book and think about where this ranks in everything I've ever read, I'd be shocked if it's not a top 15 of all time for me. I loved Shogun by James Clavell. I will read more by him. I will read more epic historical fiction as well. So drop me a comment below if you've read this book, what you thought of it, what you thought of this format as well. In honor of this book, a little different sign-off today. I'll just say, arigato gozaimasu, sayonara.